<laughs> I'm Lewis. Uh, these are some of my current collaborators. I'm at a university. People come and go. Uh, Jim Anderson is the lead investigator. Jeff Skousen helped with uh, the land reclamation part that I'll talk about at the end. Josh Cook is an undergraduate who's going to start his master's degree with me soon. And Andy Burgess is a project manager that sort of keeps us all on track. So when I lived in California, I kind of envisioned the Northeast and anything east of the Mississippi as being just one big urban blob, okay? And it's really not. Uh, but I thought I'd give you just a little bit of geographic orientation first, okay? So uh, West Virginia is right here, the lovely state of West Virginia. We are in the Chesapeake watershed, Chesapeake Bay watershed. West Virginia is a very rural state, but it's not very agricultural. And all of our confined animal operations take place in what we call our eastern panhandle, which is this little section right here. I'm not so skilled with the laser one. Okay, so this is the Chesapeake Bay. You've seen this picture many times. It's really a quite lovely place. Um, it's very beautiful, a wonderful place to visit, especially in the fall and the spring. Um, delicious seafood. And... I mention this because a lot of your, ta a fair chunk of your tax dollars are going to try and clean up the bay. And if no one has said so before, thank you for that. Okay? I, I mean, it really is a national treasure. I've had the good fortune to live in a lot of very beautiful places, and the Chesapeake is among them. Okay? And so I'm not saying that there aren't other good places worth protecting and, and trying to get back to, uh, into good condition, but the Chesapeake is really something special. And when you come visit, if you make it down to DC, all the museums are free, okay? The Chesapeake does have its problems. Not all of those are related to agriculture. I mean, it's a very dense metropolis and more people keep moving into the region every year. That creates a huge set of problems. Uh, there's a wastewater treatment problem, especially in the District of Columbia, uh, kind of an outdated system that really can't handle the, the water flows that they get. But some of it is related to agriculture. And some estimates are that 45, 50% of the pollutant load to the bay is from agriculture. And we can argue about the numbers, but what I don't think anyone would argue is that some way or another, we've got to figure out a way to get some of those nutrients out of the bay watershed. Okay, so here's our map again. Now, just of West Virginia. So again, this is three rivers. So that's Pittsburgh, um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia down here. DC is over here somewhere. This is our poultry producing area right here. So we have this continuous flow of grain from the west to this little, relatively small area where our confined animal operations are. And it's sim because of the properties of litter that we all know and have come to love it's just simply too expensive to ship it back across these mountains here, okay? So what that has done is, in, this, in our small state, created a phosphorus divide that runs right along that mountain chain. On the east so side of that mountain chain, those soils consistently test two, three, four, ten times higher phosphorus than would be recommended agronomically. On the west side, we have soils that consistently test in the low to medium soil test category. So the, it's needed on the west side in an excess on the east side. And that creates this imbalance that we are all sort of here to talk about this week. So, all right. So I am one part of a group called the Environmental Research Center at WVU that's working on a variety of pollution-related issues in the Mid-Atlantic Highlands, okay? One of which is nutrient loading to the bay. And our concept is that if we can take poultry litter, which is now an environmental liability, and create a beneficial product, in this particular case, poultry litter biochar, that we might be able to take what is now a liability and turn it into what is an asset, okay? And so what our objectives really are to try and find beneficial reuses for poultry litter biochar. This is our cooperator. He's a commercial poultry farmer in the Panhandle. Um, he produces lots of birds. He has a really lovely covered storage shed. I've only seen one in person. It, it seems pretty nice to me. 
This is his gasifier down here. It's, it's probably too large for his operation, um, which creates some issues. I'll talk about that in a minute. But he, uh, he could use that heat, to use, the heat that's from that, to heat his houses. It's not clear to me how often that is actually happening, but he does produce biochar, okay? And our task is to see if we can't do something with that biochar to make it an asset, making it a little bit more likely that we can ship it to the side of our state or other regions that are low in phosphorus, okay? So there has been a lot of work that's been done on uh, biochar, including poultry litter biochar. The vast majority of that has been on what we might call research grade biochar, right? Biochar where we know the feedstock, we know the pyrolysis conditions, we know the temperature, the time, we know everything, right? And we get a very nice product that comes out the end. That's not what we have here. We have a situation where this is a, a poultry farmer. That's how he pays his bill, selling chickens, okay? He also produces biochar. Our concept is that if there is to be a commercial biochar market, that that product is gonna look more like this and less like those 100 gram batches that you get out of the muffle furnace, okay? And if that's the case, we need to understand a little bit about more about what that stuff is, its properties, and before we can even begin to get a handle on what its beneficial effects might be. So we're starting to look at some of the salt, the nutrient concentrations, the particle size distributions, We've done a little bit of work on um, biological response, and I'll wrap up at the end talking about a, a new, it's, too, it's really too new to talk about any results, but we're trying to use this to reclaim some degra degraded surface mine soils in the western part of West Virginia. Okay, so here's what we did. We took five grams of biochar, we put it in the filter, and we leached it with distilled deionized water, and we measured what came out the bottom, okay, the filtrate. This is EC, starts out pretty high, comes down pretty low. pH stayed about 6.9, right? That's not too surprising. We know this stuff has some alkalinity in it. It has some lime value, okay? Of that leachate, most of it was potassium, an enormous amount of potassium, something on the order of 30,000 parts per million potassium, okay? The next largest component was sodium and then calcium. We got a fair amount of dissolved organic carbon that was coming off of it, which has some bearing on the overall carbon stability of this material once it's in, been placed in soils. But we also got a fair amount of dissolved inorganic carbon coming off. Oh, I broke the fundamental rule of presenting figures. Y-axis is concentration, X-axis is our individual leachates, okay, for all the, the graphs that I've shown. So then we got two different products from, from our producer, okay? And we sieve them to different size classes. So on the y-axis is the percent of the mass, and on the x-axis is the size class. The smallest particles are on the left side, the largest particles are on the right, okay? And so what we saw is we got sort of a, you know, humped distribution, but the m-type is a little bit skewed to the finer particle size, okay, a little bit. And the asterisks mean that those two means are significantly different. So then, in each of those size fractions, we did a, a dilute, dilute acid extract. So in West Virginia, Malik 1 is our soil test extractant, and so, so that's what we used, okay? And again, what we saw is that the M-type had higher phos uh, potassium concentrations than did the W-type, um, especially in the finer size classes. It kind of switched when we got to the larger size classes. But again, this tendency to decrease as the particle size got larger. For calcium, it was mostly switched, okay? And that is, there's more calcium in the larger particles than there were in the smaller particles. And then again, some small differences between the two, the M-type and the W-type, okay? So you would think with all the salt that there might be a germination problem, and that's what we expected to see. Unfortunately, our results of germination experiments have been a little bit mixed in that sometimes we see a difference, so the y-axis percent germination across the bottom of our different treatments, fertilizer, soil, 
these 24 hour and 48 hour, those refer to our attempts to try and leach out some of those salts by soaking it in water. Okay. And in this particular situation, we got a decrease in germination from the biochar, but in other experiments, we see nothing. So this was all done before we had that size class determination, and so we're probably going to go back and revisit this, see if we can't make a little bit better sense of why we're sometimes seeing a response and sometimes we're not. Okay, so it's a little bit puzzling. What we did see is that worms don't seem to like poultry that are biochar. Okay, the, this is a very straightforward kind of experiment. You set up a box with your soil, your biochar, and again our leached biochar, we attempted to remove some of the salts. You put the worms in the middle, you come back, you see where they are, they are not in the biochar. Okay. So this looks pretty straightforward. It's, it's entirely possible that the experimental design here sort of skews the results that we're getting and we hate that. And so we're also going to try and revisit this to make sure that what we're seeing is in fact the response of the worms to the biochar and not necessarily of the way we set up the experiment. So then one project that we just finished up last semester, a horticulture student helped me with this, is we used the biochar as a substitute medium for greenhouse cyclamen production. Do you recognize this plant? It's often sold around Christmas time. Okay, so um, we compared growth as measured by the number of leaves across time for the control, which is the industry standard, with the green dots uh, triangles, which are the biochar treatment, and the biochar was added roughly to substitute for the lime require the lime that would be needed in that commercial mix. Okay, and what you see is that the biochar treated plots were a little bit slow to start off. Okay, they're well below the control in the four to six week range. But by the end of the experiment, when these plants are ready to sell, there's no difference in the number of leaves. Okay, there's no difference in the basic size. So this is kind of encouraging, right? So one explanation for why this is happening is, you know, you've got this commercial mix, right? We all know that that drains really well. That's why the horticulture people use it. And so as they water this material with the biochar, once what we think is happening is once most of the salts have been leached out, then the plants can start doing their normal business and then they quickly catch up because the biochar does have a fair amount of nutrients in it. The last thing I want to talk about, and you guys are going to love me because I never use all my time. Okay? So we're trying to uh, reclaim some surface mine soils. Uh, fortunately, this is very close to Morgantown. And so this is our site right here. Everything above north of, well, let me put it this way. Everything that doesn't look like it's a mature tree was surface mined. You may have heard that called strip mining. That's not the politically correct way anymore, we call it surface mining, okay? And this mine would have gone for miles north. Right? So this is a large surface mined out complex. And as part of this company's post mining land use, they donated this back to a group that has built softball fields and there's an equine facility and there are soccer fields and that's where we have our balloon festival and so just a variety of things that are wonderful for us because it's flat, right? We're not used to such flat ground like you guys have out here. I mean, it's shocking to me. <laughs> I can see it all the way across. Right? Um, so this is our site right here, and what we're doing is we've planted miscanthus and switchgrass. And to me, I that has a nice sort of symmetry to it, right? So we've taken poultry litter, we've used it to make energy and a byproduct. The byproduct is then being used to improve a soil to produce another bioenergy crop. Okay, I like symmetry. So this is our switchgrass and miscanthus a couple months after we had it in. We put it in last spring. So we're just coming through our first winter. Um, this was in the late spring, early fall. Uh, if you have any experience with these kinds of, um, with miscanthus or switchgrass, they are very, very slow to establish. And so when you look at the experiment now, it's not much to look at, um, but in a couple years, we fully expect the switchgrass and the biochar to completely dominate the vegetation in these plots. Okay, so in summary, there is a need to move 
nutrients out of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. It's possible that poultry litter biochar is one of the tools that could be used to do that if we can find beneficial reuses for that project, for that product. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find beneficial reuses for poultry litter biochar to make it more econo economical to ship it over that phosphorus divide. Okay? Okay, questions for Lewis. Uh, consistency of the product that's produced. That's one of the things that I've seen through biochar is that you can produce it from a farm on one day and get one product and do it the same farm uh, and get a different product. What, what, what are you finding for consistency? Can you make it so I'm not recorded anymore? <laughs> no, you can't do that? Um, um, so our biochar producer is really clever guy and was kind of an early adopter in this process and so I don't want to say anything at all bad about him okay uh, he's invested a lot of his own money a lot of your money too but a lot of his own money to try and get this going very he tells us that he can produce a consistent batch from time to time the M type and the W type those are his designations for medium rare and well done <laughs> so I, I asked him, can you produce us another batch of medium rare? And he says, absolutely. I have yet to see that that's the case. I don't know that he can't. I'm just saying I don't know that he can either. But it is a problem, and I thought it was just us. Until I was talking with a friend of mine who's working with a, a wood-based biochar product from a commercial operation, and he says they have the same variability problems too. Yeah, I would just build on that. I've got five years of experience with um, turkey litter gasification attempts. Um, it's now operating commercially, but um, it's all about material handling. You know, raw poultry litter handles differently, and how much energy you put into it, how much work it sees, is going to change the reality, the porosity of that material. And the porosity of that material entering the thermal chemical process, be it pyrolysis or gasification is going to change the nature, how it burns, the distribution of heat in the process, which is going to change the nature of the char coming out. Now, on a gross average chemical analysis standpoint, one ton might look like, on average, sort of like another ton. But the morphology, the, it's, it's challenging, and it's about the material handling. And if in any way I was disparaging about research quantity biochar, I did not mean to be, because that that work is how we know those kinds of things. Right? And, uh, and, and we've also found the same thing, though. We've done quite a few um, assessments on the salt. We found the, same thing. the salt is a difficult thing to manage. I'm not sure what we're going to do. So far, is the producer just stop by it until he figures out the use? Um, he apparently is being is pretty successful at selling it. Uh, he wants to sell it to us, uh, and not necessarily for a very good price. Um, but he has no trouble getting rid of it. So they take it for recreational work? No, nope, they're just the using it as fertilizer and other parts. But it's staying in the watershed. We're not okay. yet shipping it over. What kind of weight reduction can you get? I mean, if, if the bottom line is we need to ship this across the divide, uh, how much cheaper is it going to be to ship the char than it would have been to ship the litter? I don't think there's any question it's cheaper to ship the biochar. It's a little bit nutri more nutrient dense. It's dry. Um, the fact that it's dry is kind of a, it's very dusty. It's very yucky. And so one of the things, it's very hard to handle. And so one of the things that happens when you try and leach it, you don't just lose the salts, you lose those very fine particles too. Um, and that has, is going to have an effect on what the nutrient value of that material is as well. How many tons of char per ton of litter? Does somebody know that number? I, I surely don't. <coughs> it's probably about half, I think. I mean, the analysis on char is about double what the analysis yeah. of pulse litter is. I'm looking at the weight. Tonnage, tonnage wise, um, if it were all organic, you know, and you don't have a lot of energy.
if your facility is consuming that carbon effectively. But for practical purposes, you know, in pyrolysis, you're going to have a little bit more left oh, yeah. over, over because by definition, you've got more shock. So probably around 20, 25% by weight. So let me just chime in, and this took me a little bit, okay. a little while to figure out. Some people talk about ash, right? In which case they're taking the carbon all the way to its mineral component. If you're making biochar, you have to leave some carbon there. If you don't leave the carbon there, you've lost all the benefits to improving soil that come from having recalcitrant carbon there. And there's a lot of ash in litter to start with. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Which is just going to be in your waste soil. Any additional questions? Thank you, everybody, for staying. I know it's been a long day.